Hello and welcome to SDSU Live, a live broadcast production of San Diego State University. I'm your host, Lorena Nava Ruggiero, and today I'm speaking with astronomy professor Doug Leonard about his exciting research on an exploding star. Doug, thanks so much for joining me today. It's great to be here, Lorena. Yeah, so um, I guess we should start off with the basics for all the non-astronomers like myself out there. So what is a star and what is a supernova and what is the difference? Well, let's <laughs> start from the beginning. So a star, probably the easiest thing to think about is our sun. Our sun is a big ball of gas, mainly hydrogen gas. And what makes it a star is that in the center of the star, nuclear fusion is happening, which is just basically a fancy word for a lot of energy is being produced. Okay. Planets don't do that. Okay? Our, sun, our Earth does not have a nuclear generator in, the, in its core. The sun has a, a, a mechanism to generate energy in its core. It's been doing it for about four and a half billion years. And that's what we see as the sun shining. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the uh, interesting facts about stars, though, is they are born, they live a life, and then ultimately they die. And some of nature's most massive stars, actually we think most of nature's most massive stars, end their lives in a very dramatic fashion. They explode. Okay, So they end their lives in a blaze of glory and they explode. When they explode, that's what's called a supernova. Okay, and so they become millions or even billions of times brighter than they were during their life. Wow! So, so we, they, they get our notice. At they that don't point. flicker out. They kind of go big. They don't die gracefully. <laughs> our sun, we think, will die gracefully in about another four or five billion years. So there's nothing to worry about right now. Goodness. Okay. So, uh, but in four or five billion years, our sun will rather gracefully and peacefully uh, end its life. Okay, so with that basic information then, I know that you had a study come out in Nature with a bunch of different researchers about this progenitor star that kind of uh, lived a different life, if you will. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this, this progenitor star uh, was a, is a bit surprising. Um, it turned out that, well, I should back up. So in 2005, uh, other astronomers, not us, discovered a supernova. They discovered that a star had exploded. And this happens every day. We discover supernovas every day, so that alone isn't really newsworthy. Um, this was kind of nearby, uh, about 220 million light years away. Just which next is door. <laughs> actually in our backyard, uh, uh, pretty close. Um, and once they announced that this star had exploded, uh, or that there was a supernova there, then what happens is researchers like myself and my colleague Abhishek Galyam at the Weizmann Institute, uh, we, we trawl the archives. We go back and look at old pictures that were taken of just this part of the sky. And we were lucky. Somebody in, two, in 1997 had actually photographed this part of the sky with the Hubble Space Telescope for a completely different reason. They weren't interested in this star. They were studying something else. But H, the Hubble Space Telescope maintains this archive of old pictures. We went back, looked at this old picture, and lined it up with a new picture taken with the supernova in it. And lo and behold, we found that there was a very bright star right at the exact spot that this supernova now was. And so we concluded that most likely this star was the one that it actually exploded. So it's kind of like doing forensics. You go back and you find a, you know, you're, you're doing a mystery and you go back. And so we thought we had the star. To confirm that we actually had, had nailed the star, we then waited two years. So then in 2007, we got another picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we did that because by that time, the supernova had faded beyond detection. And we then compared that 2007 image with the 1997 image and proved that the star had disappeared. It was gone. And so it confirmed that that star actually had exploded. And so therefore, we were able to confirm that we identified the progenitor star. OK. Now, as far as the life cycle of the star, what is so different about it compared to other stars? Because it, it kind of, um, from what I understand, I guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> it didn't get sucked into a black hole, which is kind of uh, interesting, I guess. We're not actually sure exactly what happens after the star explodes. Mm -hmm. the, 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 what made this discovery interesting was that the star that exploded was extraordinarily massive. Mm -hmm. uh, from our calculations, it was at least 40 or 50 times more massive than our sun. Okay? And 
according to conventional theory, there's a bit of uncertainty about what happens to stars that are that big. Do they actually explode at the end of their lives? Or do they just implode? Do they just collapse down to a black hole, a point in space where all that matter is sucked into? Mm -hmm. um, apparently, this one exploded. And that's very interesting. It's kind of uncharted territory in the observational sense, demonstrating that a star that was this initially massive actually did explode as a supernova. What's left? Well, theory says what should be left is a black hole. So right where that star exploded, there should be a black hole. We have no observational proof that there's a black hole there. So it's based on our best theoretical estimate that a star that massive should leave behind a black hole. But we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. it, when, when stars explode, they leave behind a very compact object. Okay. And uh, the most compact object you can possibly have is a black hole, which by definition is a point. It's, a, it's called a singularity, a point in space of zero size that contains matter. So, you know, you, makes your head, gives you a headache thinking about <laughs> such a thing. Uh, but that's what we think is left over at the end of this. Okay, and so it kind of um, doesn't necessarily change prevailing theory, but it gives people something to think about is what it seems it like. It tests prevailing theory. Mm -hmm. uh, there, had, there, there has been some uncertainty in prevailing theory about whether a star this massive should explode. So what I, sh what, what I, what I should say is uh, I was talking about stars and then some of them end their lives by exploding. Uh, the actual going from a star to dying as an explosion is kind of mysterious to us. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very well-developed theory about what happens to a massive star at the end of its life. And the theory basically says that once the energy source in the core of the star runs out, basically it runs out of fuel, then there's no longer anything to hold up the star. And so the center parts of the star actually collapse very quickly when the, when the fuel runs out. And that part, we think we understand very well. The, once the center of the star collapses, then the rest of it collapses down on top of it. It's kind of like, I always think of it as like Roadrunner runs off the, the edge of a cliff, and he stands there for a second, and then he looks down, and then he falls. That's kind of what happens to the rest of the star. The core collapses, and the rest of the star is like, huh, there's nothing supporting me. And then it, <laughs> and then it, all, it, it all implodes. So we understand why stars implode at the end of their lives. Turning that implosion into an explosion where everything gets shot back out into space, that's a bit mysterious. Uh, there are lots of theories about how this can work, but uh, it's an area of very active research. Very interesting. But nature shows us exploding stars all the time, so we know that nature knows how to do it, <laughs> even if we don't know how to do it. It, it sounds like it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Now, you know, what's kind of, I guess, the relevance? Because you said it's 220 million light years away. Yeah. How is this relevant to, say, Milky Way <laughs> or to us in this solar system? Well, we don't think that the sun's going to explode. Well, that's good. Okay, so <laughs> it's not going to, uh, it, it's, not, it's not the kind of discovery that is immediately uh, relevant to human beings needing to get far away from the sun, okay? Uh, and we don't think that there are any really nearby stars, really nearby meaning within maybe 50 or 100 light years of the sun. Um, if, one of the, if a star that close exploded, that would also be dangerous to us. Um, but the stars that we think are the type of stars that explode are safely placed far enough away from us. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite star that is likely to explode sometime in the next million years is uh, Betelgeuse, which is the bright red star in the shoulder of Orion, oh. the constellation Orion. So you can go out every night. I look at it, and nope, hasn't exploded yet. That's but a good sign. That star is going to explode at some point in mm -hmm. the next million years. So, so it's kind of um, more of just knowing how the world works is what it seems yeah, like. Yeah, this is definitely not going to build a better toaster oven. Uh, the, it's it's uh, uh, rather esoteric. Uh, just interesting. Humans always are inquisitive about how nature works, how the universe works, and knowing how stars die is something that at least keeps people like me up at night. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned that it's not going to build a better toaster oven, but I know we had <laughs> talked before um, the show started about how this is done with Hubble telescope and stuff. Do you think this could you know, drive people to maybe build a better telescope down oh, sure. the line? Because so this is so far away. This is exactly the reason why we built Hubble Space Telescope. It was to make the kinds of observations that just can't be made on the ground. So I should say, Hubble Space Telescope is an orbiting observatory. Um, it it's, it's, goes once around the Earth every 90 minutes, 
or so. And the reason it's very expensive to put something up in space like that. The reason we did it was so that it would be above Earth's atmosphere. Basically, when you're using a telescope on the ground, clouds mm -hmm. or just our atmosphere. The fact that Earth, you know, the fact that we have air to breathe, which is good for us, it's very bad for telescopes because the telescope has to look through all of this junk before seeing the universe. So the Hubble Space Telescope is out in space above our atmosphere, and it takes these very clear, pristine, just very pinpoint clear pictures. Um, pictures taken from the ground of the galaxy that this star exploded in don't come anywhere near to resolving an individual star at this distance. So we really needed the Hubble Space Telescope's pictures to, take the pic to, to have taken the picture. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the kind of science you can do with a space telescope that just wouldn't be possible from the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and I know we had um, talked about, I mean, years ago there had been talk of, you know, take Hubble down, it's so old, but, you know, yeah. they continue to build upon it and improve it and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, so there's another, there's a new space telescope that does, that's in development, and that hopefully will we'll go into space in several years. Uh, Hubble is doing remarkably well for a telescope that's now about 20 years in space. Um, and one of the great things about Hubble is that it was built to be serviceable. So every few years, the space shuttle visits Hubble Space Telescope, and the astronauts do these amazing things. They put in new instruments. They fix things that have broken. And they've done this several times. And they're actually planning to do it again in a few months and give Hubble one last refurbishment uh, to hopefully keep it alive for another several years uh, before this next generation space telescope goes up, which will be you know, even better than Hubble was. Very interesting. So, um, you know, in terms of future research, I know that we can't really study this star that exploded, but in terms of, you know, is it more of sitting and waiting for stars to explode and then the process starts anew? Yeah, or? so this is kind of, supernova research is kind of funny uh, because our theories are not at the point yet where we can point at a star and say, tomorrow it's going to explode, so be sure to have every telescope trained on it. Um, the way it really works is uh, astronomers, and often amateur astronomers as well, people with backyard telescopes uh, have contributed a lot to this, uh, take pictures of galaxies. Now, it would be a very boring project to take one picture of the same galaxy every night, because on average, uh, so a galaxy has several hundred million or billion stars. On average, one of them explodes every century. Oh. So it would be a bad project to just focus on one galaxy and hope for the best and hope that you get a star exploding. Instead, what people do is they take pictures of hundreds or even thousands of galaxies every night, and then they use computer software to see if there's any star that exploded in, in any of these galaxies. And so supernova research is kind of watching and waiting, and nature hands you what she's going to hand you. And uh, she sometimes gives us supernovas that are very close and sometimes very far away. Um, I, should, I should point out one of the sort of funny things. If a star explodes nearby, it's obviously very exciting to everybody because you can see it with your naked eye. Mm -hmm. okay? um, the last really bright naked eye supernova in the northern uh, hemisphere, uh, visible in the northern hemisphere, was back in the early 1600s, Kepler. It was oh. called Kepler supernova. Um, and then here's what's interesting. It's like nature was watching us. In 1609, the telescope was invented. And since then, she's been very reluctant to give us a naked eye supernova. We need telescopes to see all of them since then. There was a very bright one in 1987 that was visible from the southern hemisphere that you could see with your naked eye if you knew where to look. Um, and it was a fairly bright uh, star, but it was nothing like the one in 1604 or 1605. Um, so yeah, this is largely work done with telescopes right now. Mm -hmm. And we just have to you know, point and shoot and hope there's a, a new star exploding. Well, it's very interesting stuff that you're doing, but unfortunately it looks like we're out of time ah. for today. So Doug, thank you so much for coming in and explain to me, the non-astronomer that I am, exactly what you studied. It's, it's fascinating stuff and I think it really gives people, um, you know, thinking about the world outside of the Earth because it's so easy to get <laughs> caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff that you forget, oh yeah, there's many, many galaxies outside of here. So That's right. Thank you very it's much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Lauren. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us for SDSU Live. Um, we will have a special Earth Day episode 
actually next week with AS Green Commissioner Erica Johnson. And then um, on April 27th, we will also have uh, a great interview with some of our football team members here on campus. So be sure to join us again next week, April 22nd at noon. Earth Day episode and April 27th football. So um, again, this is SDSU Live, a live broadcast production at San Diego State University. Thanks for tuning in and we hope you do so again soon.